Deliberately paced and densely layered, Blade Runner 2049 can be a bit hard to wrap your head around. What's so important about replicants giving birth? Are artificial people any less human than naturally born people? And even after 30 years, we still want to know, is Deckard a replicant? Let's take a deep dive into this thrilling, cerebral epic. The Neville Nerves Blade Runner is the long-awaited sequel to Ridley Scott's 1982 sci-fi cult classic, which was loosely based on Philip K. Dick's 1968 novel Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? Though Scott's Blade Runner didn't do well at the box office, it was considered as the foundational film in the cyberpunk subgenre. Moreover, many critics hail it as one of the greatest American movies of all time. The idea for a sequel first emerged in the 1990s, but financing and licensing issues took more than two decades to resolve. In February 2015, it was confirmed that Denis Villeneuve would direct the sequel and that Blade Runner's protagonist character Deckard, Harrison Ford, would reprise his role. Blade Runner was set in 2019 California. The world is heavily polluted and a large chunk of the human population has already moved to off-world colonies. The all-powerful Tyrell Corporation has created bioengineered humans whose slave labor is the foundation upon which off-world communities are built. Called replicants, these humanoid beings gradually develop self-awareness and become more human. Some break away from the colonies and escape to Earth. In order to hunt them down, government-sanctioned bounty hunters called Blade Runners are recruited to retire the replicants. Because replicants are so indistinguishable from humans, Blade Runners must use a unique empathy test called the Voight Kampf test to identify them. The 1982 movie mostly revolves around Los Angeles Blade Runner Rick Deckard, who goes after four replicant fugitives. They're all part of Terrell Corp's Nexus 6 model, whose lifespan is only around four years. In his journey, Deckard comes across an alluring Nexus 7 replicant named Rachel, Sean Young. She's made with implanted human memories. Eventually, Deckard's experiences make him question the nature of human identity and the commoditized outlook of replicants. Eventually, he flees away from Los Angeles with Rachel. Blade Runner 2049 is set 30 years after the events of the first film. A lot has changed in this universe, and some of the events are hinted at within the narrative. Around 2020, Tyrell Corp introduces a new replicant model, the Nexus 8, with extended lifespans. Soon though, the replicants increasingly rebel and their manufacture is prohibited. In 2022, an EMP detonation by replicant terrorists causes a massive digital blackout and destroys the database of replicants. Tyrell Corp goes bankrupt. In the mid-2020s, ecosystem collapse has put the entire Earth on the edge of famine. Industrialist Nyanda Wallace, Jared Leto, solves the food shortage with a synthetic farming technique. Furthermore, he acquired Tyrell Corp and starts creating a new generation of replicants that obey. At the same time, the surviving older Nexus 8 models with long lifespans are hunted down by the Blade Runners. The central narrative revolves around Agent K, Ryan Gosling, and Nexus 9 Blade Runner, who carries out the job of retiring the older Nexus 8 models from circulation. This makes him visit a protein farming replicant named Sapper Morton, Dave Bautista. After a violent struggle, Agent K kills him. But before his death, Morton speaks of a miracle. It stokes K's suspicion, and he finds a military-issued trunk with a skeleton inside, buried under a tree. The subsequent analysis of the bones reveals that it was of a woman who died in childbirth at least 28 years before. The most shocking revelation is that the woman is a replicant. One of the reasons why replicants are just seen as synthetic beings and treated as slaves is their inability to reproduce. But this changes everything. This truth could dismantle the status quo. It's why the police chief, Lieutenant Joshi, Robin Wright, orders Agent K to find the child and kill him or her. The world is built on a wall. Tell either side there's no wall, you bought a war. Or a slaughter. K is an extremely docile replicant, and the idea of killing someone who was born troubles him. At the same time, he has no choice but to do the chief's bidding. K lives in a world that discriminates against replicants. He's referred to by the demeaning phrase skin job, but he tries to live a normal human life in an apartment. His emotions and desires are very human-like. This is particularly evident in his interactions with the holographic friend and lover, Joy, Anna de Armas. K also shares a particular memory with his police chief, though he knows that is an implant. In the memory, he is chased after by bullies in an orphanage. They try to snatch his beloved wooden pony. He hides the pony under the ash heap of a giant unused furnace. 
Interestingly, the date, month and year carved under the pony is possibly the same as the aforementioned child's birthday. Kay doesn't share this last detail with the chief. It could be a memory implant, but what if it isn't? Is Kay much more than what he believes himself to be? Kay's investigation takes him to the headquarters of Wallace Corp. There, he meets Love, Sylvia Hoax, Nyanda Wallace's personal assistant and a fellow replicant. She accompanies him to the company's archives and our doubts are confirmed. The skeleton is that of Rachel. Oh. Though most of the information on Rachel is lost due to the blackout, Kay hears the vocal fragments of Deckard's Voigtkampf test conducted on Rachel. Nyanda Wallace has long held doubts that Eldon Terrell, before getting killed by Roy Batty, had gifted the Nexus 7 the ability to reproduce. However, since it's now been confirmed, the powerful man with a god complex wants to get his hands on the air. Wallace harbors dreams of expanding humankind's reach in space, which he believes is possible only with the slave labor of replicants. But the current manufacturing process is limited in its scope. Hence, it is essential for him to make replicants that can reproduce. To this end, Wallace orders his perfect replicant, Love, to bring him the air before Kay finds and kills the person. Love ruthlessly kills people, including the police chief, in her mission to find the identity of Deckard Rachel's child. Kay's holographic companion Joy is enthused by the possibility that he could be much more than a replicant. She names him Joe. Subsequently, Joe's search for the child takes him to Moral Cole's orphanage. To his shock, it is the same place he often recalls from his implanted memories. At the orphanage, he discovers that every record on the kids from 2021 has disappeared. Driven by his haunting memory, Joe finds the unused furnace. To his shock, he finds the wooden pony and engraved on his bottom is the date, 6 10 21. Now Joe is nearly convinced that he is the heir. Still, he visits Dr. Anna Stillein, Carla Jury, to confirm it. Anna is the genius creator of synthetic memories. She suffers from a rare autoimmune disease and hence lives inside a big chamber isolated from the world. Anna mentions that it's illegal to implant a real human memory in a replicant. She goes through Joe's memory with tears in her eyes and confirms that it's real. The proof evidently disturbs Joe. Before he's hunted down, he wants to meet a person, Rick Deckard. Examining the wooden pony, it is revealed that it comes from Las Vegas, long thought uninhabitable due to radiation. Arriving at the abandoned Las Vegas desert, bathed in an orange haze, Joe finds that the place isn't radioactive anymore and finds few signs of life. He meets Deckard in an old abandoned hotel. After an elaborately staged scuffle, the two sit and talk about the child born to Rachel and Deckard. Deckard mentions that he didn't even know the sex of his child. He entrusted the safety of the child to the Nexus 8 fugitives and has been living in hiding to preserve the secret. Their meeting is abruptly cut short by Love's violent intrusion. She kidnaps Deckard and knocks out Joe. The sadistic replicant also destroys Joe's memory stick, which contains his own version of Joy. A tracker hidden in Joe's pocket allows a community of rebellious replicants to trace him down. The leader of the community, Fraser, I am Abbas, reveals to him that the replicants will soon start a revolt against their oppressors. This truth about the child makes them more human than human. Furthermore, she gives Joe some bad news. The child was a girl and that she herself witnessed the miracle. Fraser asks Joe to kill Deckard before he's tortured by Wallace. The disillusioned Joe walks back to his apartment and comes across a giant, naked advertising hologram of Joy. You look like a good Joe. Is everything attached to his life an illusion constructed to alleviate his artificial existence? Is there any purpose to his existence? Deep down, he knows that the emotions he withholds make him as much human as the real ones. Moreover, Joe now knows where he got his alleged childhood memories of the wooden pony. He understands the real reason behind Anna's tears. It was her memory, and she is the child of Rachel and Deckard. Joe finds a new purpose. He goes on a suicide mission to save Deckard, who is about to be taken to an off-world colony from Wallace Corp. He intercepts the spinner, flying cars, transporting Deckard, and fights Love in a tense hand-to-hand -hand combat. Instead of killing Deckard, as Fraser ordered, Joe takes him to meet his daughter Anna. Thus, Joe, the replicant, exercises free will and commits a selfless act. He awaits his death in the snow-drenched steps while Deckard tentatively steps inside Anna's laboratory. In the futuristic world of Blade Runner 2049, the pervasive male gaze says a lot about the misogyny and treatment of women. The characters in the narrative lack agency, particularly the female characters. Love is programmed to be a killing machine, although on brief occasions we see her conflicted, even shedding tears. 
but she needs to be brutal because her repugnant master wants her to be. On the other hand, the holographic Joy is simply programmed to express love and provide companionship. But Joy claims some agency for herself when she makes a decision to showcase her desire and love for Agent K, aka Joe. In one tender, as well as unsettling scene, Joy hires the services of a sex worker named Marriott to be intimate with Joe. It's also important to note that Marriott is paid to not show any agency. Villeneuve doesn't visualize anything explicitly. Before cutting to the next scene, he simply shows the hologram Joy and real Marriott moving out of sync with each other when caressing Joe, probably to emphasize the unnatural bonding. At the same time, while Joy is condemned to play the coy seductress, Joe is programmed to be the obedient Blade Runner. However, in this particular scenario, the tortured male gaze of Joe finds some catharsis as he witnesses Joy's desire to be loved. It's what brings tenderness and intimacy to the moment. Their feelings of love seem real, even though it's made up of code. In a world overrun by technologies, there's always the question of what's simulated and what's real. Is Joy simply Joe's external projection of his internal self that craves for validation and love? It's a fact that in a virtual reality, we often populate the space with our own projections and aspirations. Joy could be a combination of excellent programming and the user's fantasies. But the nagging question remains, was there more to Joy's relationship with Joe? As mentioned above in the threesome scene, we feel a sense of love and intimacy between the leads. However, when Joe loses his virtual lover and comes across Joy as a giant pink holographic ad, we see her in a different context. The words, you look like a good Joe, leave us with a bitter aftertaste. In the end, screenwriters Hampton Fancher and Michael Green leave it to the viewers to perceive how much of Joy is purely simulated and how much of her is real. When Joe meets old Deckard, who is exhausted and lonely, he sees a dog. Joe asks whether the dog is real or an artificial creation. Deckard replies that he doesn't know and doesn't care. The dog follows Deckard everywhere. That's what matters to the isolated man. For Deckard, the obedience and care the dog shows for him is very much real. At a later point, Wallace tries to play a trick on Deckard by bringing in front of him a near-perfect copy of Rachel. But Deckard rejects Wallace's gift because it feels unreal to him. The same thing could be said about Joy and Joey's feelings for each other. It's all in the perception. One of the most time-worn narrative tropes in Hollywood and popular culture is the idea of the Chosen One. Luke Skywalker in Star Wars, Harry Potter, Neo in The Matrix are some examples of such narrative setup. Oftentimes, massive conflicts are solely built around these protagonists and it's revealed that these heroes are destined for greatness. It's a potent storytelling tool which has been around since antiquity. Blade Runner 2049 for a moment makes us believe that it's only about Kay or Joe's journey and him realizing his potential. Joe eventually comes to terms with the truth. There may not be a larger purpose to Joe's existence, but he does find a purpose and perfectly executes it. He's not the one, yet his final altruistic act could very well initiate a bigger change in the conflict between humans and replicants. Nothing much is revealed about Rick Deckard and his background in Scott's Blade Runner, and so it led to a theory that Deckard could be a replicant. To support this theory, there's the dream Deckard has which involves a unicorn. Deckard's brooding and silent partner Gaff, Edward James Olmos, shows a penchant for creating origami figures. He leaves an origami of a unicorn at the end of Blade Runner, which hints that Gaff knows about Deckard's recurring dream. How? Maybe it was an implanted dream. Blade Runner 2049 also doesn't answer the question, but hints that he could be a Nexus 7 replicant like Rachel. When Wallace interrogates Deckard in his pyramid-like headquarters, he wonders if Deckard was purposely created to fall in love with Rachel and produce an offspring with her. Wallace could simply be provoking Deckard by calling him a replicant puppet, designed to serve a single purpose. Wallace himself definitely has ulterior motives. He wants to know the secret of Nexus 7, who is gifted with a fully functioning reproductive system, the secret which was lost with the blackout in 2022. Wallace also wants to know the identity of Deckard and Rachel's child, it's clever to leave the answer to this question open-ended, which brings a layer of mystery to Anna. Is she a hybrid of human and replicant? Or is she only a replicant who was born and not made in a laboratory? Denis Villeneuve brilliantly expands on the Blade Runner universe, although there are quite a few unanswered questions in the sequel. It depicts the story of a man who chooses to be part of something larger than him. In the haunting final shot, we witness the end to this man's heartbreaking journey but there's more to Blade Runner's universe which should be explored further. Unfortunately, Blade Runner 2049 didn't do well at the box office, much like the first film. 
Yet, the intelligent, slow-burn sci-fi is gradually gaining its legion of admirers. Thankfully, a sequel series titled Blade Runner 2099 is in works at Amazon Studios, and Ridley Scott is behind the project. What do you think of Blade Runner 2049? Let us know in the comments below, and you can read our full analysis on our website.